Okay, well, uh, 1896 turn opens up with a lot of activity. First of all, six big events. And most of them came out as unrest, scattered, even in the United Provinces over here in Afghanistan, Barbara, to the English have, uh, Madagascar. These are going to be, for the most part, just play, Afghanistan's kind of a pain. That's, Russia may just take that one on the chin and lose their interest there. They can rebuild it later. Afghanistan's tough to fight. They have a 10 defensive factor, which means it takes a hell of an army to conquer Afghanistan. And once you do so, it's really not worth maintaining control of. But most of the others are either established protectorates or possessions or something. So the country involved kind of wants to suppress the situation. The U.S. has an interesting opportunity here with Central America and unrest. They have an influence there, so they're the only person who can go in there, and they can go in and get control of it at this point. They certainly want to do that. Uh, there are very few provinces left that people can grab, and that's one that you can grab without offending people. Well, let me amend that. England can still throw an influence marker into there because it's a blue area and have a Cassis Belli if the English, if the uh, British, uh, if the Americans put the thing down. Of course, if the English, it's kind of a, a timing situation again. If the English don't put it in there, then the Americans get kicked out. If the English put it in there and the Americans don't resolve it, the English get kicked out too. Usually, I just allow people to grab those if they want. And then Serbia defies Austria-Hungary. Hey, sounds like World War I. Um, European tensions went up by four, and now Germany can, march, can use the Austrians to march into Serbia. And this is a big deal, because if the Austrians conquer Serbia, and again, same kind of situation, somebody could throw an influence in there to prevent it. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about that. Let me see how this is. No. No. It has nothing to do with... It's not an unrest. Uh, if the Austrians march in there, they can just attack it. It doesn't... It's not an establishment of a counter-type situation. And if they succeed in winning, they can take control of it uh, and actually add it to Austria-Hungary. Why is that big? Well, not just because of the five buck value that Austria-Hungary would get uh, in production for it, and they can use their whole army for this. Uh, but also it gives Austria access to Bulgaria, not to Greece, but to Turkey as well. And that's a nice outlet. I always like this event for the Austrians. It gives them a, a big advantage. So we're seeing advantages for Germany and, and the U.S. I don't know where the rest of it's going to pan out. So after the movement and status marker placement, this turn has turned out with a lot of underlying tension. Nobody quite knows what's going to happen. The United States seems to have gotten away with its no biggie there, and also slipping into here. Mainly because there's a lot of action going on. First, this pressure, Germany and France. England knows they're being pressured by them, so they turn to Italy and kind of secretly cut a deal. They're going to sign a secret treaty. I've already marked it, but that's going to happen in the negotiation phase. Uh, defensive alignment for the game. It'll be revealed at the end of this turn because Italy wants to collect its points for it. Part of the deal is if... Italy can prevent a great can prevent uh, a German French alliance and this is all a timing thing and this is why this is why the game's kind of stale to me uh, not just solo but even in opposed play it's not absolutely clear how this all goes remember when I was saying over with the Congress of Europe well you can't just declare war before there's a Congress well actually you better be able to because here's what's going to happen if some kind of incident arose, and I don't know if it did or not, where France or Germany can declare war on England, or vice versa, then it comes down to this race between Germany and Italy. Whoever declares war first is in, the other one isn't. If they want to come in, they start the Great War and take the doubled penalty, which is very, very bad. So, you have this kind of ugly situation where, you know... It's not absolutely clear whether or not you have to go to the conference before you declare war. And if you do declare war, it still comes down to this, whoever has this sort of verbal uh, dexterity to spit it out first may get an advantage at some point. In some cases, it's the opposite, where you want to wait each other out, which is how the play of the pieces is. 
but I find that all very annoying. And, you know, it's part of the flaw of the game. It, it's okay, too. I mean, not playing it solitaire is kind of cool because it's almost like a party game in that aspect. But come on, you know, this is a fairly uh, detailed, not a, not a detailed simulation, but it's a, a significantly more complex game than most people have with party games. And it just doesn't feel like that element belongs in here. And it's not expressly written into the rules that way, but it's clear the last person who declares war, you have to be on your edge, you have to be ready to cut in and jump in and do things. And really, knowledge of the rules... So for the most part, you don't have to know a lot of the rules and, and the way they interact and try to guess how they work to play most of the game. But then you come to these weird little cases where, to tell you the truth, the rules don't suffice. Um, I've tried, and I, I can only imagine how this is done PBM, I've tried doing it in ways that would work PBM with like plotted declarations and stuff like that. Or, hey, you want to declare, okay, you put that in your hand and you say whether or not, you know, you bid whether or not you're going in or whatever you want to do. Boy, did those not work. The whole game turned into a great war automatically. Um, I was with a bunch of Canadians at a convention first time they played it. I ran the game for them, and none of them would back down because, you know, it's secret. When you know the move that you're going to take is going to lose is going to lose you the game, you don't take it. When you're not sure, you might all take it anyway. Um, yeah, this is this kind of feeling about it, and and the timing issues. They're really what kind of drove me away from the game in a lot of ways. Anyway, I've got some colonial combat to take care of. We've got some definite. Uh, conflicts here. Britain and Germany are, are, are challenging each other. Italy's managed to sleaze into a couple of areas because of their deal with Britain. They know that they, they Britain has told them, ah, I'll support you because it'll be a great war and the third person, can, the fourth person can't come in and then I can take out either one. Now that's kind of questionable because both Germany and France have pretty potent navies at this point. And England's also gotten itself into a little tango with the Japanese down here. And the Japanese have built up a huge navy. Now, Japan is not part of this little game. They don't play in the Great War thing. They actually have no effect on it. Same with the U.S. Tensions, with all the naval building and everything, have risen up to 82. So, it's possible, actually, this war would be a big enough colonial event that it will push the... Uh, you know, with two points per, per round of war and all the expenses for going through the uh, effects of the war, that this will push it through into a great war anyway. And then, whoever declared war first takes the penalty. So Britain doesn't want to declare war. <laughs> because they still think that they're in the lead. And that puts a big harness on everyone else saying, whoa, wait a minute, I could lose the game here. I'm probably not going to beat Britain, but maybe I have a shot at second or third or something like that. Nobody can beat Britain. Usually, you have to kind of trick them into it or, or bludgeon them earlier than this. That European tensions has gone too high, and that's one of the problems. Once you start building navies, you can challenge Britain. Britain starts building navies, and the number just keeps getting higher and higher, and it pushes the tensions higher and higher, and you're not going to get that nice, clean colonial war you want. So this may actually all kind of get resolved <laughs> due to fears, even though Britain's cut this alliance with Italy to try to prevent, to try to make this a, two, uh, a, a, a even fight between England and someone else. Of course, countries like Japan. Japan wants a war with with France. They couldn't engineer that. That's actually why they went in here was a hope to get a war with France. But they couldn't get England to say, "Yeah, I want Japan on my side." England's not really interested in that. They want a one-on-one -on -one fight with one of these powers. All right. Anyway, I'll take care of the colonial combat, see what happens after the negotiations, and we'll come back. So here's the essential problem in most games of this uh, Pax Britannica break into this. <laughs> Germany, France, Japan, all these countries that want a war with England. Japan, not so much, but Germany and France. Certainly Germany, who's got the opportunity right now, and they calculated it. They are clearly well behind England. But here's the problem. They declare war on England. European tensions go up to 90. Who makes the next declaration? Italy? Well, then it's Germany alone against England. 
France, okay, France drives it up to, either one drives it up to 95. Now, that means the war has to end in two rounds or the game's over and Germany takes a loss. They have to negotiate. And this is a painful situation because the game actually ends up, I bet you, dragging on because powers will not be able to push uh, the tensions up higher. Basically, England also cannot say, "Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna back, you know, I'm, I'm I'm gonna violate this and I'm gonna attack Germany or uh, France or or anyone really or Japan," because by doing so, they'll have started the Great War. <laughs> that ends up in um, boiling things over. Uh, now, so basically everything has to be allowed now. All these co-dominions are settled. And they're not particularly good ones. This one's going to produce two bucks. It's a two bucks province because of the uh, change in the rules that uh, Kostikin put into play. This one's only a three buck area. These kind of things, you know, these are not worth <laughs> uh, what's going to be happening. And what little is left is going to be partitioned out and taken. You have Tareg here. French or U.S. can grab that. Maybe both will end up grabbing it. And again, it's a valueless property at that point. Uh, some countries like Italy, by their gaming of this situation, got away very, very well. Uh, the other countries, not so much. They're sitting on huge navies they cannot use without causing the Great War. Uh, so yeah, we're going to negotiate. And then it comes to checking uh, Chinese resentment. Well, what we did get, which might end the game, although at 85, it's got to go quite a ways. Uh, usually this won't happen. But we got a Chinese rebellion. So what's going to happen is, somewhere or another, there's a chart. I think the Japanese may have it. Yeah, I think everybody has it, actually. Uh, the Chinese Army placement table that we're going to roll up randomly. First of all, there's a random number of Chinese, so, uh, sorry, rebellion units, I think. Yeah, you roll a die to see how many you get. They show up randomly. They move around and they can attack, they move programmed sort of semi-randomly. Um, they're going to try to approach enemy units in Chinese Empire and vassal areas. And they fight them. If they win, they kill them. If they end their movement after combat in a space with any markers, including just influence markers, those markers are cleared away and removed and... Uh, that can be quite devastating with things like uh, Manchuria, for example, especially if the game were to end this turn. On the other hand, uh, areas that they're in that don't have a control marker, they get a defensive value or an additional value for attack or defense, for that matter, equal to the combat strength of the area. So, in some cases, they can do quite well. Now, if, you if the allies subject... Uh, in a coordinated fashion, whatever, uh, as a group, manage to defeat areas, those areas become available as spoils of war. Everyone involved, everyone with troops in China or in the vassal states, and anyone can enter them who's already got at least an influence marker, uh, are allowed to demand a, a space. Now, the U.S. has a victory point bonus, if it can get its troops there, and it probably can, uh, to prevent anyone from being able to get, uh, that ad to get additional territory in China. Everyone kind of gets an advantage if we can get Hong Kong knocked out, everyone but Britain. Uh, other players would like to, but usually it's very hard to come to an agreement because something like Manchuria gets ca conquered and each person c can only be given one territory. I don't think co-dominions are allowed in this case. It doesn't specify that they're not, but it seems to imply it. And, well, it's pretty hard 
to divvy things up equally unless you conquer a big chunk of low value territories, these moderate four value territories in China, in which case people would accept. Of course, something like Hong Kong, that is a dangerous place. That is a place where the English can get knocked out. But for the most part, you don't gain things in China through a Chinese uh, revolt, largely between the U.S. and the difficulty of coming to an agreement. Anyway, I'll roll up where the Chinese are, and, well, I'll kind of show the progress of this, but uh, it probably won't end the game, <laughs> unfortunately. So we got four armies, one, interestingly enough, right in Hong Kong, another one here in Quang Si. So the Brits are in danger of losing Hong Kong right away. Uh, one in central China, which is two away from Hong Kong, but also two away from Korea, so it kind of randomly goes to one or the other. And then this guy over here, who's going to head probably into Manchuria as the closest route into Korea. And shit! Damn camera. Killed the video there because I clicked it thinking I was skimming in a little bit and I skimmed in a lot. Sorry about that, folks. <sighs> anyway, uh, as we can see, the units where they're close to, this one might go either direction. These guys are going to go into Hong Kong and attack. So here's the annoying gamesmanship about China. Japan has pulled out of Korea. They're in Formosa, though. The Chinese cannot get to Formosa. It is a Chinese vassal area. The Chinese rebellion can't end as long as there are Japanese there. The Brits can pull out of Burma. Again, no great loss. The French can pull out of Indochina. And the Chinese have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to even head towards. There's no reason for them to particularly move, so it becomes kind of a problem there. I'm going to check the errata, see if anybody, if uh, Kostikin came up with an answer to this, because this is goofy. And it's always bothered me in Chinese uh, revolts, was the, I, uh, we can wait until the European troops come. There's no emergency for all these protectorates and influences and everything. None of them are going to get hurt. We had the big loss, Manchuria and Hong Kong. Those usually don't happen, though. Usually Hong Kong gets uh, evacuated. I got lucky for the Chinese in that two units got put right near Hong Kong. Yeah, the errata does cover the issue because conceivably the West might not be able to even intervene in China. All they cover it with is it's up to the Western allies, the, the European powers, whatever, to decide whether or not the war's over. Well, they pretty much owned that decision themselves anyway. Uh, all it does is prevent the possibility of the game hitting a it-cannot-continue point because Formosa is occupied and, say, the West doesn't want to land troops there and China is held by the Chinese and then you can come to some sort of peace. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of randomly move the Chinese armies around, uh, clear things out, destroy influence and interest markers. That gives some, some reason for some of these powers to actually intervene. That choice, though, meant Japan lost Korea. <laughs> the Russians weren't going to come in and try to save the Japanese bacon there. So, all, all that really uh, happened, well, I randomized. Now, by the base rules, they should have kept going to get somewhere. But actually, the French would have pulled out um, of Indochina. They don't want to be there right now. They want their troops to push in to defend Indochina next turn, and they'll take the Japanese in, or the Chinese at that point which will be the closest to them. But everybody wanted to get out so that there was a chance of that happening. So, yeah. Um, and also some more influences went over here and here, uh, just eating up the wealth that's present in China. There's not going to be a second revolt this game. So people will be restoring those, but it costs them a little bit of income. Well, nice trick time. So the French went in to defend Indochina, the only person anywhere in China right now are the Japanese. They've lost the thing they wanted. They're going to declare the revolt a success for the Chinese. Because the Brits pulled out of here 
to try to make sure that the French would get hit in Indochina. This is a nice trick. Um, that's going to clear all of China, make the Chinese revolt successful. I've got to recount everything, but everybody is pissed at the Japanese, sort of. But it is really the English fault for not being here. Had they been here, uh, the Chinese would not have gone for them. They would have gone into Indochina first. Hmm. I don't, I'm not going to let them make that mistake. That's just too, too vile. Uh, the problem is, next turn, the Americans will land. Um, and the Americans don't particularly want China to be wiped out, but maybe they do. They don't have much here. Um, so maybe they can be persuaded to stand out, too. There's a lot of other people taking a lot of hit for this that will have to build up. Uh, things like this English territory here are going to be hard to establish. Most of what the U.S. has is pretty minor, so Japan, I think, can probably convince them. But we'll have the Brits uh, um, in place to prevent the Japanese from being able to declare the whole Chinese war a loss. There are British troops coming in, though, so it's not going to be an easy thing for the Brits to, to be dislodged. Uh, actually, I lied. Uh, the Brits were here. They have to land on the Indian Ocean. I don't have anything down in the South China Sea. Tell you the truth, they're not going to do it. They're going to let, they're going to pull back. And now the Japanese and the Americans have agreed. This is a successful civil war for China. I've never seen that, but I've never played with this rule that allowed the guy who's in Formosa to decide, yeah, you're okay. <laughs> we have a piece here. Um... So the first thing that does is it clears this. I have a huge amount of record keeping to take care of. We do have one more uh, end of the turn because the Brits weren't out earlier. Had I let them stay out earlier, this wouldn't have happened, but whatever. So we're at 93. You know, that means what? Well, it means everybody backs down from everything and the game just continues. And really the only thing that can cause the game to bubble over at this point is random events. I've seen games go two or three turns in this kind of position. It's not a good situation. There is a lot to do though. There's investment in China, for example. All right, I'll come back at the end of this. I gotta rework all the paperwork uh, because the extent of the, the damage that the Chinese did is just so great. I can't calculate, I can't trust that my calculations are right. It's gonna be a pain in the ass. It's gonna take about an hour and a half to figure it all out. If I, I was playing with, um, you know, in a multiplayer game, it would take maybe 20 minutes because each person is counting up all their stuff individually. But in something of this size, you know, with me doing seven, yeah, it's gonna take a while. Yeah, that took less than an hour. First counting, of the US was hellish. I had to do it several times, same with the Brits, but then I kind of got in the pattern of counting, so it probably took a little over a half hour. Um, victory points at the end of the turn came by. And uh, right now, in terms of what's stored up, Belgium's in the lead with 189. That's pretty damn potent, to tell you the truth. Uh, next is 41 with Italy, who had a lot of points to bank this turn. Plus, they have the English Alliance. 32 for the U.S. And then we get kind of, oh, 29 for Germany. That's not bad. But then we get into the teens, 16 and 13 for France and Russia. And, of course, negative 3 for the Brits uh, because of ignoring a dominion. That moves us into the 1900 turn. <sighs> and if we get lucky, events or something else may push us by that people don't get to choose. Um, it's also possible that you, that, so if people place something stupid, like an influence mark or someplace where somebody can put uh, a protectorate, or if there's an interest marker where somebody has a protectorate and they can upgrade it to a possession, these are things that that player could be forced to drive the uh, tensions up. The problem is some of these players with low divisors kind of actually want the game to continue. Um, they can score more points the longer the game goes on 
than Britain can with their uh, high maintenance costs to their economic investment. Basically, if you have interest and influences, you're in a position. But let's say uh, Portugal goes up. Well, that's six points added right away. That doesn't quite raise it, but let's say we were a little higher in European tensions. That six points could mean that one of those three people is going to send it up. How do you decide who? Again, uh, when you play live, often it's verbal dexterity. Whoever spits it out first is safe. The last guy to do it, ah, uh, shit, too bad for you. Um, you could also do that down to die rolls or something like that. But it does. It, it's not just verbal. If it was just verbal, it would be one thing, but one thing is you have to be kind of aware of everything that's going on. Somebody upgrades an area that you're in danger in, and you have to withdraw your thing during the mark adjustment segment rather than during uh, the negotiations. Pretty much everybody should be aware enough, and we shouldn't see any spillover like that, which is why these games will go longer than my solo ones than a real-life one would, because in a real-life one, somebody would screw up.